Hey everybody, Carl Shoup here from Snorkel.tv. I'm totally excited to share with you my first exploration into using an object-oriented program approach in one of my little tutorials here. Uh, whereas most of my tutorials show you how to build things from the ground up, here I'm going to be deconstructing a working project to explain how all the different parts works together. Uh, I'm really honored to have the opportunity of revealing to you the mythology, methodology, I'm sorry, used in the extremely popular yet fantastically mystical greensock.com homepage animation that you're seeing right here. Um, although it might appear that this could be an elaborate timeline animation, it is all scripted animation. And instead of having a single timeline light instance with 400 lines of code in it, each section or slide is its own unique object which allows you to modularly isolate the animation for each slide. Now you'll notice that this animation here can be rewound, and we can also scrub through it. So we have all the benefits of Timeline Light, Timeline Max, Tween Light, all that good stuff. Now by using a class or blueprint for each slide, it's really easy to have multiple slides share the same animation sequences and functionality. It's also possible to extend the functionality of the basic slide class and create custom animation when need be. Now in this example here, we're gonna be showing you how a document class can be used to glue all the animate in and animate out sequences of each slide together into one cohesive and centralized timeline for ultimate control and flexibility. Now, the majority of my tutorials usually focus on a single AS3 concept or perhaps a single feature of the GreenSock tweening platform. You know, I find that most people feel it's much easier to just slam a few lines of code into frame one of an FLA when trying to understand something new and to complicate things with the mental overhead of understanding how the code can be structured into different pieces. Now, in this session, I'm going to be assuming just some basic knowledge of OOP terminology and theory. Uh, you know, you should sort of know what a class is, what a package is, um, and then I'll give you some resources to uh, read up on those things. Basically, the first three chapters of any OOP AS3 book uh, is enough, um, or I highly recommend Doug Winnie's um, Action Script 101 series. Um, I'll link to that too. Um, but right now, consider this more of a behind the scenes look at how you can use OOP to structure the behavior of your Flash apps in a more modular fashion. Uh, although the OOP approach is often more verbose and requires a bit more work from the beginning, ultimately you will end up with a project that is much more clean and organized. Uh, furthermore, you'll find that if you structure things correctly, you're going to have a much easier time finding where to make changes when things go wrong, you can modify one aspect of your app without risking breaking other parts, which is great. And you can also reuse features and functionality of your app over and over again. So, you know, we're not going to focus on all the nitty gritty details of OOP here. I want this more to be like that light bulb moment where you say, oh, now it makes sense um, why you would use this and you can see some of the benefits. Now, in my demonstration here and all the source files we'll be looking at, I'm going to be using a dumbed down version of the GreenSock homepage animation that doesn't include any of the bonus plugins that are only available to shockingly green Club GreenSock members. Side note, if you are shockingly green, the homepage production source files are freely available for you to explore. Another side note, <clears throat> I'm also having a contest right now where you can win a really green membership and get shockingly green for only $49. End of plug. But anyway, I assure you guys that my version here uses the exact same core techniques and methodology as the official GreenSock homepage animation because I basically started with that and took out all the extra stuff. So we're going to take a little look at my version here. You've been watching it for the last few seconds. And what I want you to realize is that there are four pieces of text that animate in and out. Now, if you pay attention really close, you guys will see that the first three slides have the same animation, and this is because they're all instances of the basic slide object, which dictates how that animation will run. Uh, one of the key things to remember here is that each slide will animate in and out. That's the basic behavior of a slide, showing up and leaving. Now, each slide has a animate in method and an animate out method, which details how that sequence is going to run. By telling each object to execute its animate in and out methods in a particular sequence, we can then produce elaborate linear animations. So we'll say, hey, slide one, animate in now, 
three seconds later, slide one, animate out, and then tell slide two to come in. And by um, tweaking the timing of these events, um, we can have our animations overlap, we can adjust the delay, we have a whole bunch of flexibility there. Now, the last animation in this whole group where the words explode um, has its own unique animation sequence because its class extends the sl slide class and overrides the default animate in and animate out methods. We'll get into those words like extends and override um, in due time. Now, a little bit of a side note, and some of you may know this already, I am not an OOP expert. So the benefit here is that I will not be confusing you with unnecessary and elaborate terms that you encounter way too fast in most training material. You know, I find I get to chapter four of an OOP book and all of a sudden they're throwing stuff out here from left field and I don't really get the basics yet. Maybe that's just me. All right, so well, although we may use some of the following terms, I'm not gonna scare you off with them. So don't worry about encapsulation, composition, namespaces, access modifiers, interface, design patterns, model, view, controller, the flex SDK, command line compiler, all that sort of nonsense, all right? We're just gonna be focusing on how you can have your basic movie clips be dictated by a class blueprint, and then we're gonna show you how we can communicate uh, with these objects and share their functionality um, across the board. All right, next thing we're gonna do is look at the FLA. All right, kitties, let's see how this gizmo is built. All right, so here in Flash I have the FLA open, which pretty much is just a repository now of all the visual assets. There's really no code at all in this movie. Um, taking a look at the timeline, you'll see that we only have a single frame here. There aren't any tweens in here. Uh, we have layers for the little slider that comes on at the end there. So it's a slider component. And in each layer, I have movie clips for each one of my slides. So I can just uh, option click here to show you all the different layers that I have. Option clicking hides all layers but the one that I'm clicking on, which is pretty cool. All right, or I can show all of them. So let's go back and just see intro MC. All right, this guy right here, he's just a very basic movie clip. If I double click on him, you'll see there's no code inside of this movie clip. And all we really have here is a static text field. All right, I didn't go crazy having a lot of assets on each slide. Again, I wanna focus on the mechanics of all this. So there's no animation in frame one. There's no, I'm sorry, there's no action script in frame one. There's no action script in any of my movie clips. So when we're using OOP, all of your action script is going to be stored in external AS files or action script files. If we go over to my finder, um, here's my project folder. And you'll see that I have my Carl Greensock home.fla. And in the same folder as that, I have main.as. This is referred to as our document class. Uh, the code we're going to find in this script is similar to what we would normally put just on frame one of our movie. Uh, so instead of having this code in the FLA, by storing it externally, it makes it easy to uh, look at the code without updating the FLA. And also, if you are using uh, source control programs, uh, it's very easy to uh, check just the action script in and out uh, without having to go through the FLA. Um, we also have a subfolder here for slides, which are action script classes that are specific to this project. All right, we'll be talking about slide.as, which is the main blueprint for every slide. And then override as has some special um, slide animation in it as well, which we'll talk about. We still have note the com folder, which has all of our green sock goodies in there. Okay, I just want to point out that all the action script is in main.as and override and slides.as. So let's go back into Flash. And I want to show you that each one of these movie clips needs to be told which class to be using um, for all of its information, its properties, and its different methods. So intro MC here is, is the first slide that comes on. And if I go to my library, you'll see here that we have a clip called intro and it has a linkage for intro as well, which is a way of identifying symbols in the library for use with ActionScript. And I'm gonna right click and go to the properties here. And what you'll see is that I'm telling this movie clip um, to use the following class info. It's gonna have its own unique class name, which uh, Flash is going to 
sort of created class file for us. Um, but the base class is what's important. It's saying look inside that slides folder for the slide object or the slide class. Okay, so by doing this, this movie clip has access to all the script inside of that external action script file. So if I go toggle over to um, slide.as, this is all the code that is going to be um, sort of inherited, if you will, by that movie clip. Now we're going to talk about this code in a minute, um, but I want to compare and contrast how storing the script in an external file is a bit superior to the old-fashioned way where really um, we would put this script inside of the movie clip, okay? Back in the olden days, we would take a movie clip like this little ball here, and when I double-click on it, we'll go to the Actions panel, and we could have some script inside the ball that did stuff like this. This is good old action script too, where we just set up some random numbers for change X and Y, and we give this clip its own on enter frame events where it moves this ball sort of in a random direction. So all this code is inside of the ball movie clip. And now when I test this movie out, that ball will always go in a different direction constantly. And what you could do back in the old fashioned days, of course, was you could copy this ball over a zillion times. I could make bunches of them and just do something like this. And now every ball has the same on enter frame um, where at 30 frames per second or whatever, it's moving in a different X and Y position. So that stuff was all fun and good. All right. But now in the modern age, what we do is we do not put code inside movie clips. We store it externally. Now, one of the main benefits of the external method is that I can have multiple types of movie clips using the same code. Right now, in this old school file, if I wanted to draw, say, um, who knows, a rectangular movie clip and have it do the exact same sort of movement routine, well, I would have to go inside of the ball, take the code, and literally copy it out and then paste it inside my square movie clip. So then I would have the same code in multiple places and of course, once that happens, once you start making changes to one of the objects, you would then have to update it in the other object if you wanted to keep everything the same. So yes, in ActionScript 2, it was really easy to set some stuff up, but not so easy to maintain. With my newfangled method, what I can do is I can say that the intro clip and the in-out clip, sorry, let's go to properties, are both going to use the same external base class. So I can have 50 slides that all have access to the exact same information, the exact same action script as far as properties and methods. So they can all have the same behaviors, all right? But they are visually different. So as a refresher, let's just test this guy out and you'll see that each one of these movie clips that I have on the stage is sliding in and sliding out. So what we're going to do is show you how each slide knows to do that. And lastly, we have our custom slide, which does its own little animation here. And at the end, the slider automatically comes up and we can slide uh, and scrub. So let's just close this out. So let's take a look at what is inside of that slide action script file that's controlling um, directly the first three movie clips that I'm using for intro, in, out, and oop. Okay, so here we have slide.as. Let me uh, kill my properties panel here, give you guys some breathing room, and we'll get rid of this guy. And you'll see right now that, you know, I'm not going to go into how you build a package, as I said earlier. Um, but the first thing that happens inside of our class is that we import all of the other classes and packages that this object will be using. Okay, Our slide starts out by extending the movie clip class, which means that this object is going to have access to all the properties and methods of a movie clip, and then whatever we want to tack onto it in addition. The first function that we encounter is referred to as the constructor function, 
And the first thing that function does is it calls super, which means that it tells its parent um, class to initiate itself and run everything it needs to run. So this says, hey, movie clip, make sure all your ducks are in a row. Init then calls a special initialization function for this very slide. And so even though in my FLA here, you'll see that on scene one, frame one, all the slides are concurrently visible and positioned in the same place, whenever they get activated on the stage, their custom class tells them that their alpha and visible property should be set to false and uh, zero or vice versa. So because those movie clips are slides, they're automatically invisible the second they get added to the stage. Now here is the main meat. This is showing me that every slide has a method called animate in and animate out. Okay, And what these methods are going to do are create little mini timelines that have information about how they should be tweened. All right, now if you're totally new to GreenSock's tweening platform, um, I'm probably going to lose you right here. Um, but all of you guys have been following me for a while, this code is going to look very familiar. So if you need some uh, brushing up on Tween Max and Timeline Light, uh, check out snorkel.tv and greensock.com. All right, so the animate in method is going to create a small timeline that tells this object, whichever movie clip is using this class as a base class, that it should fade in to an auto alpha of one, which means its alpha will fade to one. And when that's done, or when it begins, the visible property will also be set to true. And then while that is happening, we're just gonna do a simple slide, meaning horizontal movement tween, from a X position relative, meaning 400 pixels from the right of where you normally are, and we're going to also start off with a little blur tween as well. So notice that this is a from tween. What's cool about this is that in Flash, I can position all of my elements where I want them to be resolved. So if I'm working off a standardized you know, PSD file storyboard where an artist or designer has shown me how each keyframe of the animation should resolve and look, in Flash, I just have to align my assets um, in a way so that everything is where it should be when it's done animating in and then inside of my action script I can just say okay you're gonna end up where I put you but I'm gonna tell you to start from somewhere else and move your butt over to where you should be alright so when this is all said and done this function generates just a mini timeline that shifts this object around okay there's also an animate out function where we generate another little timeline and that contains the animation for this thing moving away. Now since I have multiple files using slide AS as a base class, what I can do is make little changes here and it will affect all the slides that use this blueprint. Okay, so something I could do really quick is say let's not have you slide in from so far away. Let's make you slide just uh, 20 pixels. I'll save this file, and when I test, you'll see now that all three pixels don't have all that left to right horizontal movement. So I made one simple change, and it affected all three of these first slides that come in. It's not going to have any effect on the last slide because that slide uses a custom animation, okay? That's different. So there's animate in, animate out. I could play with things in here all day long. Um, let's say that my stage gets resized or for some reason I didn't align things properly. In my init function, I could also tell each movie clip that their Y property uh, should equal or su should be subtracted a little bit. I'll say minus 100. And so there you go. I just moved everything up. Not the best number to choose, but all these movie clips say that, hey, since I'm a slide, when I start out, my Y position should be changed, okay? And that happens on init there. All right, so let's get rid of that little change. And let's also make sure that that's set back. So every object that is in fact a slide is going to do this animate in and animate out routine. Now these functions don't get just 
don't get triggered automatically within slide, something else is telling each slide when these functions should be called. So that's what's happening in our document class. And remember our document class um, is pretty much akin to what we would normally put in frame one of our main timeline of our FLA. If I go to the properties panel for my FLA file, you'll see that if I click on the stage, it says that this document should use the class main. And that means that there is going to be a file next to this FLA called main.as. And again, if we look inside of my finder, you'll see that here's my FLA and here is main.as. And so this is all the code that would typically be run on frame one or as soon as the Swift gets executed. So let's go to main.as and let's take a little tour through here. Um, again, we start by importing all of the packages and classes that this file is going to need. Um, what we commonly do is tell our main file to extend the movie clip. We're declaring a few stage instances. So I'm telling my movie, hey, I'm going to have something called intro MC, which is using the slide class. And this is the instance name of that movie clip on the stage. Okay. And all four of these are going to be slides. And scrolling on down, I have some uh, properties here called animate in offset, which is really how much to wait for an in animation to happen, meaning once the previous item goes out, how long are we going to wait before the next one comes in? Uh, by storing this number sort of globally, I can affect the timing of all the slides in one place. We also have animate out delay, which is going to tell us how long we should wait before a slide leaves the stage. Now we're also going to have a property or an item called timeline, which is going to be a timeline max instance, which is going to be the accumulation of all the animate in and out timelines all glued together with the proper timing. Um, anytime we have anything related to the slider, I'm just sort of going to skip over it because that's not really necessary at this point. So again, in the constructor, we're calling super, which tells, you know, all the movie clip goodness to get itself running. And then we have an init function, which is specific to this main class that we're working in. And what's going to happen first as a nice little bonus is that we're going to tell all of our tween light plugins, which ones should be activated. And once we do this in the document class, we don't have to do this in any of the other classes that we're, we're dealing with. They will automatically have access to uh, these plugins, which is really super cool. Uh, slider stuff in, don't worry about. Here I'm now assigning values to animate in offset and animate out delay. So this three here means that every slide will stay on the stage for three seconds. If I change that down to 0.5, you'll see that that one change in one place is now going to affect the speed of my animation. And so these slides, once they come in, they instantly go out. Okay, So they're only there for half a second, and then they take off. So once this guy comes in, boom, he's out of there. So there we have the global control that is totally awesome. And in fact, I'm going to keep that number low right for now. Here we're creating a new timeline max instance, and it's going to start paused. When it's done, our slider is going to come in, and we're also storing the uh, time scale property here so that we can easily speed up and slow down our entire animation once again. So here we have the meet, public function start, okay? This start function is what builds our timeline. And you'll see that once the init function runs, start gets called. And then here, we'll talk about start time in a minute, but this is the meat, real meat of the matter. This is why everything works. And that's because we're building a timeline that now consists of what all of the slides animate in and out methods produce for us. So the first thing we're adding to our timeline is the timeline generated by the intro MC when we call it animate in function. I remember every slide when we call it animate in is going to return a child timeline light, if you will, to whatever object called it. All right, so this is how this is works. And we're going to tell our timeline, hey, 
first thing we're going to do is tell the intro MC to give me its business for animate in. And we're going to start this 0.5 seconds after the whole movie gets initialized. Then we're going to say, hey, let's tell the intro MC to give me its animate out routine. And we're going to add this to our timeline based on this number right here, animate out delay, which is right now 0.5 seconds. Let's make it one second. All right. And then we're going to add a little label. This is just a little bonus here so that I can mark all the uh, different points in time in my timeline where new sections come in. And we're also going to tell the OOP MC, hey, give me your timeline for animate in and animate out and so on and so on down the line. So I now have one master timeline that allows me to grab all of these animate in and animate out sections. So the first three do that very basic slide and de-blur effect. Now this last one called override, that's a little bit different. Remember um, our last animation, it's sort of word by word flying in and word by word flying out. So how was that done? Let's go over to my green sock home FLA and here we have the override movie clip. All right, let's just visually take a look at it here. Any slide can override the default animation for something completely different. Looking at the internals of this movie clip, you'll see that we have um, text one here and then we have something called text two, text three, text four, text five. And if we go to the properties for override, you will see that here, its class is not just slides, but in the slides package or folder, we're saying look for the override AS file. So this guy uses something new. And if I go to override.as, um, you'll see a few things here. A, it looks very much like the official slide action script file. But here we're saying that override is going to extend slide. So that means by default, it's going to have all the stuff that slide has, plus possibly a little bit more. And so when we construct override, we're going to tell slide to, in fact, do all of its initialization stuff because super calls the constructor on the class that we are extending. Um, so here, what we're saying is that instead of calling slides init function, we're going to override it or we're going to overrule it. This function here has authority over the init function in slide. So since override extends slide, remember it means that it will do everything that slide does unless we tell it differently. So slide has its own init function and we're going to say, you know what? We don't necessarily want that right now. So override has its own init which also sets it visible to alpha, visible to false and alpha to zero. But in addition to that, we're creating an array of all the different movie clips that we have. Uh, so we're just creating a, a simple loop here that contains each one of my text items. Since I named them text one, text two, text three, text four, uh, it's pretty easy to build that array. Okay, so that's unique to the override object. Next, we also have animate in and animate out functions, but they're very different because what they're doing is they are using all twos to tell each one of those movie clips, you know, to play in a certain sequence. So I'm not going to go line by line through how these timelines look. But the big thing here is that these methods are called animate in and animate out. All right, and they override the default animate in and animate out that a slide object would normally have. But since these functions use or methods use the same exact name, this is the key point here. When I'm in main AS and I'm creating my timeline, when I get down to the override MC, I'm still just calling animate in and animate out. I'm not using some hard to remember custom method name here. It's the same as all the other slides. So all of these objects share similar methods. So it makes it very easy. I don't care if it's override or oop or intro. As long as I tell one of my objects to animate in, I know it's going to work. Okay. It doesn't matter that animate in does something slightly different in this object. Um, 
what matters is that I can call that function and the in animation is going to be returned to me. Um, I believe maybe it's the Colin Mook book, uh, but when they explain these concepts, think of it if you had um, an animal class, right? And animal class would dictate that an animal could speak. Um, but then you might have a duck and a dog and a cat object that would extend the animal class. Um, but they would all still have a speak method, but their speak method would do something differently. When I tell the duck to speak, it will quack. When I tell the dog to speak, it will bark. When I tell the cat to speak, it will meow. Same thing happens here. When I tell any of my slides to animate in, something different may happen, or maybe they'll all animate in or speak in the same way. All right, so that is the basic concept there. All right, folks, to wrap up quickly, I'm just going to show you a few more time-saving benefits of using this method. Let's say that the last slide that we're animating needs some tweaking, all right? But we don't want to watch the entire animation in order to see our changes. Uh, we have this start time variable here, which can either be a number or a string or anything, but it's going to be a time in seconds or a string label value. I'm going to say, why don't you start at the label called override, and then once the timeline is fully built, we say timeline go to and play start time. All right, so we'll save this out and test. And now the override slide is the first one that I see. All right, that can save me hours. Let's just undo that back to zero. The next thing I want to talk about is putting a negative offset value in here so that we can have our tweens overlap. Right now our slides animate in, go away, and then the next one comes on. All right, what if I want things to come in while the previous thing is going out? Well, for that, it's fairly simple. And what I'm going to do is scroll on up to my animate in offset. All right, and we're setting that right here, I'm sorry. I'm gonna make that a negative number so that literally the item coming in next starts right when the previous item goes out. So I'm just going to say negative one to make this really clear. All right. So now it's not one thing, then the next, we're having an overlap. And we'll test that out. And you'll see that this first one comes in, and then the other one comes in as soon as it, the other one is going out. So that can be pretty cool. That would be a nightmare to try to edit uh, with a regular Flash IDE timeline there. Uh, another thing I want to show you, which um, if you've used Timeline Max before, you're pretty much aware of, but I alluded to this earlier, and that is the time scale property. So by keeping it right in the constructor here, I can globally speed up this entire timeline, and it will affect all the tween durations and all of the delays. So if I say, just make this thing play twice as fast and save, you'll see now that everything happens very, very quickly. And conversely, I can slow that all down just by changing that one variable. So guys, I really hope this has opened your eyes to a new way of approaching these things. Again, download these files and tear them apart. You know, I've shown you pretty much all I could without going on for hours and hours. I thank you for hanging in there with me. Uh, so download these files, tear them apart. And really, I would challenge you to go into, again, the FLA file here and try to create a new movie clip that ex uses the slide class and then add it to your main timeline in main. And if you're really ambitious, try to create a custom animation and make your own new class that will extend slide, just like my override file does. All right, guys, it's a wrap, it's a wrap, it's a wrap. I'll catch you soon.